Chapter 5 The Jackal's train arrived at the Gare du Nord just before lunch and he took a taxi to a small but comfortable hotel in the Rue de Chouerson, leading off the place. De la Madeleine while it was not a hotel in the same class as the d'Angleterre of Copenhagen or the Amigo of Brussels, he had reasons for wishing to seek a more modest and less known place to stay while in Paris. For one thing his stay would be longer, and for another there was far more likelihood of running into somebody in Paris in late July who might have known him fleetingly in London, under his real name than in either Copenhagen or Brussels. Out on the street he was confident that the wraparound dark glasses he habitually wore, and which, in the bright sunshine of the boulevards were completely natural, would protect his identity. The possible danger lay in being seen in a hotel corridor or foyer. The last thing he wished at this stage was to be halted by a cheery well, fancy seeing you here, and then the mention of his name within the hearing of a desk clerk who knew him as Mr. Duggan. Not that his stay in Paris had anything about it to excite attention. He lived quietly, taking his breakfast of croissants and coffee in his room. From the delicatessen across the road from his hotel he bought a jar of English marmalade to replace the blackcurrant jam provided on the breakfast tray, and asked the hotel staff to include the jar of marmalade on his tray each morning in place of the jam. He was quietly courteous to the staff, spoke only a few words of French with the Englishman's habitually atrocious pronunciation of the French language, and smiled politely when addressed. He replied to the management's solicitous inquiries by assuring them that he was extremely comfortable and thank you. M. Duggan, the hotel proprietress told her desk clerk one day, asked extreme and jaunty un vrai gentleman there was no dissent his days were spent out of the hotel in the pursuits of the tourist on his first day he bought a street map of paris and from a small notebook marked off on the map the places of interest he most wanted to see these he visited and studied with remarkable devotion even bearing in mind the architectural beauty of some of them or the historical associations of the others. He spent three days roaming round the Arc de Triomphe or sitting on the terrace of the Café de l'Elysée scanning the monument and the rooftops of the great buildings that surround the Place de Ayatoil. Anyone who had followed him in those days, and no one did, would have been surprised that even the architecture of the brilliant M. Hausmann should have attracted so devoted an admirer. Certainly no watcher could have divined that the quiet and elegant English tourist stirring his coffee and gazing at the buildings for so many hours was mentally working out angles of fire, distances from the upper stories to the eternal flame flickering beneath the arc, and the chances of a man escaping down a rear fire escape unnoticed into the milling crowds. After three days he left the atoll and visited the ossuary of the martyrs of the French resistance at Mont Valerian. Here he arrived with a bouquet of flowers. And a guide, touched by the gesture of the Englishman to the guide's one time. Fellow resistance, gave him an exhaustive tour of the shrine and a running. Commentary. He was hardly to perceive that the visitor's eyes kept straying away. From the entrance to the ossuary towards the high walls of the prison which cut off all direct vision into the courtyard from the roofs of the surrounding buildings. After two hours he left with a polite thank you and a generous but not extravagant poor boy. He also visited the Place de Invalides, dominated on its southern side by the Hotel de Invalides, home of Napoleon's tomb and shrine to the glories of the French army. The western side of the enormous square, formed by the Rue favored, interested him most, and he sat for a morning at the corner cafe where the Rue Favorite adjoins the tiny triangular place de Santiago du Chile. From the seventh or eighth floor of the building above his head, number 146 Rue de Grenelle, where that street joins the Rue Favorite at an angle of 90 degrees, 
he estimated. A gunman would be able to dominate the front gardens of the invalids, the entrance to the inner courtyard, most of the place to invalids, and two or three streets. A good place for a last stand, but not for an assassination. For one thing, the distance from the upper windows to the graveled path leading from the Invalid's palace to where cars would be drawn up at the base of the steps. Between the two tanks was over 200 meters. For another the view. Downwards from the windows of number 146 would be partly obscured by the topmost branches of the dense lime trees growing in the place de Santiago and from which the pigeons dropped their off-white tributes onto the shoulders of the uncomplaining statue of Vauban. Regretfully, he paid for his Vitel manth and left. A day was spent in the precincts of Notre Dame Cathedral. Here amid the rabbit warren of the Lie de la Site were back stairways, alleys, and passageways. But the distance from the entrance to the cathedral to the parked cars at the foot of the steps was only a few meters, and the rooftops of the Place du Parvis were too far away, while those of the tiny abutting square Charlemagne were too close and easy for security forces to infest with watchers. His last visit was to the square at the southern end of the Rue de Rennes. He arrived on July 28. Once called the Place de Rennes, the square had been renamed Place du 18 June 1940 when the Gaullists took power in the city hall. The jackal's eyes strayed to the shining new nameplate on the wall of the building and remained there. Something of what he had read the previous month returned to him. 18th June, 1940, the day when the lonely but lofty exile in London had taken the microphone to tell the French that if they had lost a battle, they had not lost the war. There was something about this square, with the crouching bulk of the Gare. Montparnasse on its southern side, full of memories for the Parisians of the war. Generation, that caused the assassin to stop. Slowly he surveyed the expanse of tarmac, crisscrossed now by a maelstrom of traffic pounding down the Boulevard de Montparnasse and joined by other streams from the Rue d'Odessa and the Rue de Rennes. He looked round at the tall, narrow fronted buildings on each side of the Rue de Rennes that also overlooked the square. Slowly he wended his way round the square to the southern side and peered through the railings into the courtyard of the station. It was a buzz with cars and taxis, bringing or taking away tens of thousands of commuter passengers a day, one of the great mainline stations of Paris. By that winter it would become a silent hulk, brooding on the events, human and historical, that had taken place in its stately, smoky shadow. The station was destined for demolition. The jackal turned with his back to the railings and looked down the traffic artery of the Rue de Rennes. He was facing the place du 18 June 1940. Convinced that this was the place the President of France would come, one last time, on the appointed day. The other places he had examined during the past week were possibles, this one, he felt sure, was the certainty. Within a short time, there would be no more Gare Montparnasse, the columns that had looked down on so much would be smelted for suburban fences and the forecourt that had seen Berlin humiliated and Paris preserved would be just another executive's cafeteria. But before that happened, he, the man with the KP and two gold stars, would come once again. But in the meantime the distance from the top floor of the corner house on the western side of the Rue de Rennes and the center of the forecourt was about 130 meters. The jackal took in the landscape facing him with a practiced eye. Both corner houses on the Rue de Rennes where it debouched into the square were obvious choices. The first three houses up the Rue de Rennes were possibles, presenting a narrow firing angle into the forecourt. Beyond them the angle became too narrow. Similarly, the first three houses that fronted the Boulevard de Montparnasse running straight through the square east to west were possibilities. 
Beyond them the angles became too narrow again, and the distances too great. There were no other buildings that dominated the forecourt that were not too far away, other than the station building itself. But this would be out of bounds, its upper office windows overlooking the forecourt crawling with security men. The Jackal decided to study the three corner houses on the western side of the Ruta. Ran first, and sauntered over to a cafe on the corner at the eastern side, the Café de Chessan. Here he sat on the terrace a few feet from the roaring traffic, ordered a coffee, and stared at the houses across the street. He stayed for three hours. Later he lunched at the Hungsi Brasserie Alsacienne on the far side, and studied the eastern facades. For the afternoon he sauntered up and down, looking at closer quarters. Into the front doors of the blocks of apartments he had picked out as possibles. He moved on eventually to the houses that fronted the Boulevard de Montparnasse itself, but here the buildings were offices, newer and more briskly busy. The next day he was back again, sauntering past the facades, crossing the road, to sit on a pavement bench under the trees and toying with a newspaper while he studied the upper floors. Five or six floors of stone facade, topped by a parapet. Then the steeply sloping black tiled roofs containing the attics, pierced by mansarde windows, once the quarters of the servants, now the homes of the poorer pensioners. The roofs, and possibly the mansardes themselves would certainly be watched on the day. There might even be watchers on the roofs. Crouching among the chimney stacks, their field glasses on the opposite windows and roofs. But the topmost floor below the attics would be high enough, provided one could sit well back into the darkness of the room not to be visible from across the street. The open window in the sweltering heat of a Paris summer would be natural enough. But the further back one sat inside the room, the narrower would be the angle of fire sideways down into the forecourt of the station. For this reason the jackal ruled out the third house into the Rue de Rennes on each side of the street. The angle would be too narrow. That left him four houses to choose from. As the time of day he expected to fire would be the mid-afternoon, with the sun moving towards the west, but still high enough in the sky to shine over the top of the station roof into the windows of the houses on the east side of the street, he eventually chose those two on the west side. To prove it, he waited until 4 o'clock on July 29, and noticed that on the west side the topmost windows were receiving only a slanting ray from the sun, while it still fiercely lit the houses on the east. The next day he noticed the concierge. It was his third day sitting either at a cafe terrace or on a pavement bench, and he had chosen a bench a few feet from the doorways of the two blocks of flats that still interested him. Within a few feet, behind him and separated by the pavement down which pedestrians scurried endlessly, the concierge sat in her doorway and knitted. Once, from a nearby cafe, a waiter strolled over for a chat. He called the concierge Madame Baird. It was a pleasant scene. The day was warm, the sun bright, reaching several feet into the dark doorway while it was still in the southeast and south, high in the sky over the station roof across the square. She was a comfortable grandmotherly soul, and from the way she chirped, bonjour, monsieur to the people who occasionally entered or left her block, and from the cheerful bonjour, Madame Baird that she received each time in return, the watcher on the bench 20 feet away judged that she was well liked. A good-natured body, and with compassion for the unfortunate of this world. For shortly after two in the afternoon a cat presented itself and within a few minutes, after diving into the dark recesses of her loge at the rear of the ground floor, Madame Baird was back with a saucer of milk for the creature she referred to as her little minute. 
shortly before four she bundled up her knitting, put it into one of the capacious pockets of her pinafore and shuffled on slippered feet down the road to the bakery. The jackal rose quietly from his bench and entered the apartment block. He chose the stairs rather than the lift and ran silently upwards. The stairs ran round the lift shaft, and at each curve on the rear of the building. The stairs halted to make room for a small half landing. On each second floor this landing gave access through a door in the rear wall of the block to a steel fire escape. At the sixth and top floor, apart from the attics, he opened the rear door and looked down. The fire escape led to an inner courtyard, around which were the rear entrances to the other blocks that made up the corner of the square. Behind him, on the far side of the courtyard the hollow square of buildings was penetrated by a narrow covered alleyway leading towards the north. The jackal closed the door quietly, replaced the safety bar, and mounted the last half flight to the sixth floor. From here, at the end of the passage, a humbler staircase led to the upper attics. There were two doors in the passage giving access to flats overlooking the inner courtyard and two others for flats on the front of the building. His sense of direction told him either of these front flats contained windows looking down into the Rue de Rennes, or half sideways onto the square and beyond it the forecourt of the station. These were the windows he had been observing for so long from the street below. One of the name plates next to the bell pushes of the two front flats he now confronted bore the inscription MLLE Berenger. The other bore the name MET. Madame Charrier. He listened for a moment but there was no sound from either of the flats. He examined the locks, both were embedded in the woodwork, which was thick and strong. The tongues of the locks on the far side were probably of the thick bar of steel type so favored by the security conscious French, and of the double locking variety. He would need keys, he realized, of which Madame Baird would certainly have one for each flat somewhere in her little loge. A few minutes later he was running lightly down the stairs the way he had come. He had been in the block less than five minutes. The concierge was back. He caught a glimpse of her through the frosted glass pane in the door of her cubby hole, then he had turned and was striding out of the arched entrance. He turned left up the Rue de Rennes, past two other blocks of apartments. Then the facade of a post office. At the corner of the block was a narrow street. The Rue Litra. He turned into it, still following the wall of the post office. Where? The building ended there was a narrow covered alleyway. The jackal stopped to light a cigarette, and while the flame flickered glanced sideways down the alley. It gave access to a rear entrance into the post office for the telephone exchange. Switchboard night staff. At the end of the tunnel was a sunlit courtyard. On the far side he could make out in the shadows the last rungs of the fire escape of the building he had just left. The assassin took a long draw on his cigarette and walked on. He had found his escape route. At the end of the Rue Litre he turned left again into the Rue de Vaugirard and walked back to where it joined the Boulevard de Montparnasse. He had reached the corner and was looking up and down the main street for a free taxi, when a police motorcyclist swept into the road junction, jerked his machine onto its stand and in the center of the junction began to halt the traffic by shrill blasts. On his whistle he stopped all the traffic coming out of the Rue de Vaugirard, as well as that heading down the boulevard from the direction of the station. The cars coming up the boulevard from Duroc were imperiously waved into the right-hand side of the road. He had barely got them all stopped when the distant Wail of police sirens was heard from the direction of Duroc. Standing on the corner looking down the length of the Boulevard de Montparnasse, the jackal saw 500 yards away a motorcade sweep into the Duroc junction from the Boulevard de Invalides and start to head towards him. 
In the lead were two black leather clad motards, white helmets gleaming in the sun, sirens blaring. Behind them appeared the shark-like snouts of two Citroen DS-19s in line astern. The policeman in front of the jackal stood bolt upright. Facing away from him, left arm gesturing rigidly down towards the Avenue du Main on the southern side of the junction, right arm bent across his chest, palm downwards, indicating priority passage for the approaching motorcade. Heeling over to the right, the two motors swept into the Avenue du Main, followed by the limousines. In the back of the first one, sitting upright behind the driver and the ADC, staring rigidly in front of himself, was a tall figure in a charcoal grey suit. The jackal had a fleeting glimpse of the uptilted head and the unmistakable nose before the convoy was gone. The next time I see your face, he silently told the departed image, it will be in closer focus through a telescopic sight. Then he found a taxi and was taken back to his hotel. Further down the road near the exit from the Duroc metro station from which she had just emerged, another figure had watched the passage of the president. With more than usual interest. She had been about to cross the road when a policeman had waved her back. Seconds later the motorcade swept out of the Boulevard de Invalides across the expanse of cobbles and into the Boulevard de Montparnasse. She too had seen the distinctive profile in the back of the first Citroën, and her eyes had glowed with a passionate fervour. Even when the cars had gone she stared after them, until she saw the policeman looking her up and down. Hastily she had resumed her crossing of the road. Jacqueline Dumas was then 26 years old and of considerable beauty, which she knew how to show off to its best advantage for she worked as a beautician in an expensive salon behind the Champs Elysees. On the evening of July 30th she was hurrying home to her little flat off the place to Bretuel to get ready for her evening's date. Within a few hours she knew she would be naked in the arms of the lover she hated, and she wanted to look her best. A few years earlier the thing that mattered most in her life was her next date. Hers was a good family, a tight-knit group with her father working as a respectable clerk in a banking house, mother being a typical middle-class French housewife and mom and she finishing her beautician's course and Jean-Claude doing his national service. The family lived in the outer suburb of Le Vezine. Not in the best part, but a nice house all the same. The telegram from the Ministry of the Armed Forces had come one day at breakfast towards the end of 1959. It said that the minister was required with infinite regret to inform Monsieur and Madame Armand Dumas of the death in Algeria of their son Jean-Claude, private soldier in the first colonial paratroops. His personal effects would be returned to the bereaved family as soon as possible. For some time Jacqueline's private world disintegrated. Nothing seemed to make sense, not the quiet security of the family at Le Vezine, nor the chatter of the other girls at the salon on the charms of Yves Montand or the latest dance. Craze imported from America, Le Rock. The only thing that seemed to pound through her mind like a tape-recorded loop going eternally round the same bobbins was that little Jean-Claude, her darling baby brother, so vulnerable and gentle, hating war and violence, wanting only to be alone with his books. Scarcely more than a boy whom she loved to spoil, had been shot dead in a battle. In some godforsaken wadi in Algeria, she began to hate. It was the Arabs, the loathsome, dirty, cowardly melons, who had done it. Then Francois came. Quite suddenly one winter morning he turned up at the house on a Sunday when her parents were away visiting relatives. It was December, there was snow in the avenue and crusted onto the garden path. Other people were pale and pinched, and Francois looked tanned and fit. He asked if he could speak to Mademoiselle Jacqueline. She said, same oi meme. 
and what did he want? He replied he commanded the platoon in which one Jean. Claude Dumas, private soldier, had been killed, and he bore a letter. She asked him in. The letter had been written some weeks before Jean-Claude died, and he had kept it in his inside pocket during the patrol in the Jebel looking for a band of Felaga who had wiped out a settler family. They had not found the guerrillas, but had run into a battalion of the ALN, the trained troops of the Algerian National Movement, the FLN. There had been a bitter skirmish in the half-light. Of Don and Jean-Claude had taken a bullet through the lungs. He gave the letter to the platoon commander before he died. Jacqueline read the letter and cried a little. It said nothing of the last weeks. Just chatter about the barracks at Constantine, the assault courses and the discipline. The rest she learned from Francois, the pull back through the scrub. For four miles while the outflanking ALN closed in, the repeated calls on the radio for air support, and at 8 o'clock the arrival of the fighter bombers with their screaming engines and thundering rockets. And how her brother, who had volunteered for one of the toughest regiments to prove he was a man, had died. Like one, coughing blood over the knees of a corporal in the lee of a rock. Francois had been very gentle with her. As a man he was hard as the earth of the colonial province in whose four years of war he had been forged as a professional soldier. But he was very gentle with the sister of one of his platoon. She liked him for that and accepted his offer to dine in Paris. Besides, she feared. Her parents would return and surprise them. She did not want them to hear how. Jean-Claude had died, for both had managed to numb themselves to the loss in the intervening two months and somehow carry on as usual. Over dinner she swore the lieutenant to silence and he agreed. But for her the curiosity became insatiable, to know about the Algerian war. What really happened, what it really stood for, what the politicians were really playing at. General de Gaulle had come to the presidency from the premiership. The previous January, swept into the Elysee on a tide of patriotic fervour as the man who would finish the war and still keep Algeria French. It was from Francois that she first heard the man her father adored referred to as a traitor to France. They spent Francois leave together, she meeting him every evening after work. In the salon to which she had gone in January 1960 from the training school. He told her of the betrayal of the French army, of the Paris government's secret negotiations with the imprisoned Ahmed Ben Bella, leader of the FLN, and of the pending handover of Algeria to the Melons. He had returned to his war in the second half of January and she had snatched a brief time alone with him when he managed to get a week's leave in August in Marseilles. She had waited for him building him in her private thoughts into the symbol of all that was good and clean and manly in French young manhood. She had waited throughout the autumn and winter of 1960, with his picture on her bedside table throughout the day and evening, pushed down her nightdress and clasped to her belly while she slept. In his last leave in the spring of 1961 he had come again to Paris, and when they walked down the boulevards, he in uniform, she in her prettiest dress, she thought he was the strongest, broadest, handsomest man in the city. One of the other girls at work had seen them, and the next day the salon was a buzz with news of Jackie's beautiful para. She was not there, she had taken her annual holiday to be with him all the time. Francois was excited there was something in the wind. The news of the talks with the FLN was public knowledge. The army, the real army, would not stand for it much longer, he promised. That Algeria should remain French was, for both of them, the combat-hardened 27-year-old officer and the adoring 23-year-old mother to be, an article of faith. Francois never knew about the baby. 
he returned to Algeria in March 1961 and on April 21st several units of the French army mutinied against the metropolitan government. The first colonial paras were in the mutiny almost to a man. Only a handful of conscripts scuttled out of barracks and made rendezvous at the prefect's office. The professionals let them go. Fighting broke out between the mutineers and the loyal regiments within a week. Early in May, Francis was shot in a skirmish with a loyalist army unit. Jacqueline, who had expected no letters from April onwards, suspected nothing until she was told the news in July. She quietly took a flat in a cheap suburb of Paris and tried to gas herself. She failed because the room had too many gas leaks, but lost the baby. Her parents took her away with them for their August annual holidays and she seemed to have recovered by the time they returned. In December she became an active underground worker for the OAS. Her motives were simple, Francois, and after him Jean-Claude. They should be avenged, no matter by what means, no matter what the cost to herself or anyone else. Apart from this passion, she was without an ambition in the world. Her only complaint was that she could not do more than run errands, carry messages. Occasionally a slab of plastic explosive stuffed into a loaf in her shopping bag. She was convinced she could do more. Did not the flicks on the corners, carrying out snap searches of passers-by after one of the regular bombings of cafes and cinemas, inevitably let her pass after one flutter of her long dark eyelashes, one pout of her lips. After the Petit Clamart affair one of the would-be killers had spent three nights at her flat off the place de Bretuil while on the run. It had been her big moment. But then he had moved on. A month later he had been caught, but said nothing of his stay with her. Perhaps he had forgotten. But to be on the safe side, her cell leader instructed her to do no more for the OAS for a few months, until the heat wore off. It was January 1963 when she began carrying messages again. And so it went on, until in July a man came to see her. He was accompanied by her cell leader, who showed him great deference. He had no name. Would she be prepared to undertake a special job for the organization? Of course. Perhaps. Dangerous, certainly distasteful. No matter. Three days later she was shown a man emerging from a block of flats. They were sitting in a parked car. She was told who he was, and what was his position. And what she had to do. By mid-July they had met, apparently by chance, when she sat next to the man. In a restaurant and smiled shyly at him while asking for the loan of the salt cellar. On his table. He had spoken, she had been reserved, modest. The reaction had. Been the right one. Her demureness interested him. Without seeming to, the conversation blossomed, the man leading, she docilely following. Within a fortnight they were having an affair. She knew enough about men to be able to judge the basic types of appetites. Her new lover was accustomed to easy conquests, experienced women. She played shy, attentive but chaste, reserved on the outside with just a hint now and Again that her superb body was one day not to be completely wasted. The bait. Worked. For the man the ultimate conquest became a matter of top priority. In late July her cell leader told her their cohabitation should begin soon. The. Snag was the man's wife and two children who lived with him. On July 29th they. Left for the family's country house in the Loire Valley, while the husband was required to stay on in Paris for his work. Within a few minutes of his family's departure he was on the phone to the salon to insist that Jacqueline and he should dine alone at his flat the following night. Once inside her flat, Jacqueline Dumas glanced at her watch. She had three 
hours to get ready, and although she intended to be meticulous in her preparations, two hours would suffice. She stripped and showered, drying herself. In front of the full-length mirror on the back of the wardrobe door, watching the towel run over her skin with unfeeling detachment, raising her arms high to lift the full, rose-nippled breasts with none of the feeling of anticipatory delight she used to feel when she knew they would soon be caressed in Francois Palms. She thought dully of the coming night and her belly tightened with revulsion. She would, she vowed, she would go through with it, no matter what kind of loving he wanted. From a compartment in the back of the bureau she took her photo of Francois, looking out of the frame with the same old ironic half-smile. He had always smiled when he saw her flying the length of the station platform to meet him. The picture's soft brown hair, the cool buff uniform with the hard-muscled pectorals beneath, against which she loved once long ago to rest her face, and the steel paratrooper's wings, so cool on a burning cheek. They were all still there, in her alloyed. She lay on the bed and held Francois above her, looking down like he did when they made love, asking superfluously, alors, petite, tu, ver. She always whispered, we, oui, tu sais bien. And then it happened. When she closed her eyes she could feel him inside her, hard and hot and throbbing strength, and hear the softly growled endearments in her ear, the final stifled command veins, veins, which she never disobeyed. She opened her eyes and stared at the ceiling, holding the warmed glass of the portrait to her breasts. Francois, she breathed, help me, please help me tonight. On the last day of the month the jackal was busy. He spent the morning at the flea market, wandering from stall to stall with a cheap hold all by his side. He bought a greasy black beret, a pair of well-scuffed shoes, some not too clean trousers, and after much searching along one's military greatcoat, he would have preferred one of lighter material, but military greatcoats are seldom tailored for midsummer and in the French army are made of duffel. But it was long enough, even on him, stretching to well below the knee, which was the important thing. As he was on his way out, his eye was caught by a stall full of medals, mostly stained with age. He bought a collection, together with a booklet describing French military medals with faded color pictures of the ribbons and captions telling the reader for which campaigns or for what kinds of acts of gallantry the various medals were awarded. After lunching lightly at Queenie's on the Rue Royale he slipped round the corner to his hotel, paid his bill and packed. His new purchases went into the bottom of one of his two expensive suitcases. From the collection of medals and with the help of the guidebook he made up a bar of decorations starting with the Mita Isle Militaire for courage in the face of the enemy, and adding the Mita Isle de la Liberation and five campaign medals awarded to those who fought in the Free French Forces during the Second World War. He awarded himself decorations for Berhakame, Libya, Tunisia, D-Day and the Second Armored Division of General Philippe Leclerc. The rest of the medals, and the book, he dumped separately into two waste paper. Baskets attached to lamp posts up the boulevard mails herbs. The hotel. Desk clerk informed him there was the excellent Etoile du Nord Express for Brussels leaving the Gare du Nord at 5.15. This he caught, and dined well. Arriving in Brussels in the last hours of July. Authors note, the old Gare Montparnasse facade was demolished in 1964 to make way for office block development. The new station building has been erected 500 yards further down the railway line. 